Here is a badly drawn map of Africa. It should be like that, really. And here is a badly drawn map of South America. I bought, drew them both. Okay, so what do you notice about these two? What I noticed about these two ages ago when I was in primary school and as a result got lost in cover for four months was that they fit together like that. And so that sort of suggests that I'm trying to get rid of the emotional baggage that's connected with that observation because of what happened as a result. If you take into account the continental shelves, which are the shallow bits of sea around continents, continents in particular, South America and Africa, tend to fit together very well. And in fact, you can see that in other places, like for example, Antarctica and the southern coast of Australia also fit together very well. So, that observation was made by Alfred Wiegenoch, ironically named, in at the turn of the 20th and 19th centuries. And although it was an interesting observation and fitted with a number of other observations, it wasn't accepted as a scientific theory yet. The theory at the time, and here's a book that's out of copyright, what needed to be explained was that there were similar fossils and mineral deposits, coal deposits for example, in various parts of the world. For example, there's a synapsid, that's something that most people refer to as a mammal-like reptile, which existed in the in South America and in, I think it's South America, South America, Africa and Antarctica or something like that. It's sort of exists in a sort of range across there. In fact, it was almost the only large land animal there was at the time because nearly everything had just been wiped out. Uh, that fossil exists across that whole range. Another one is Synognathus, which is a rather dog-like animal, which exists in South America and again in Africa. The fossils exist there. And another example is the coal deposits, which exist in the eastern part of North America and the western part of Eurasia. So they exist in Europe and in eastern North America and also in Siberia and China but not in other parts of the world. And then there's a plant fossil called Glossopteris which again exists all the way across the southern continents but not in northern continents. And so they had some kind of theory which explained this which in this out of copyright book uh, is, can be illustrated like this. There you have a map of the world uh, with land bridges between continents that are now joined together and the idea was that these land bridges enabled the animals and plants to spread along these different lines. However, that was what they thought right up until the middle of the 20th century. Then, Wiegenoch had his theory, he'd already had his theory, but the thing is he couldn't explain how these things, enormous land masses, could float around and join together like a jigsaw puzzle. There, um, he came up with this idea that was called Poolflucht, um, but he was very much on the fringes. And I think we should bear in mind that a lot of scientific hypotheses do start off on the fringes. So a lot of things that we might think of as fringe science nowadays could in fact be mainstream science in, at some point in the future. However, then it turned out that somebody discovers that what one thing that happened with lava and magma in the interior of the Earth was that it welled up and pushed things along. And so what you have is you have these zones in the middle of the oceans, with the exception of the Pacific, which push apart and they drive continents apart and they move them around. And if you run the film backwards, as it were, you end up with something that looks like this. I think that's the right way up. Yeah, that's the right way up. Okay, now this bit down here is Antarctica. Um, India's in there somewhere. No, India's in there somewhere as well. Uh, North America is there, I think. Um, Eurasia's there. Uh, that is the future Mediterranean Sea and so forth. So they were all joined together in one place. But they weren't lost in space. So, that's the theory that people have nowadays and it's supported by various bits of evidence. For example, this welling up, if you look at the Atlantic, the magnetic field of the Earth shifts around. Now, if there are magnetic particles in lava, these can be moved 
so that they align with the lines of the earth that is a magnet before it solidifies and then as they spread what you find is that there are symmetrical stripes on each side of the ocean which match these things so that strongly suggests that that's what's happening there's a sort of conveyor belt process going on that pushes them apart so the idea of Paulflucht is no longer necessary and the theory becomes a lot simpler but still had quite a lot of difficulty being accepted. I think it didn't actually happen until the 60s. And that is the interesting thing from the point of view of science, the way that scientific theories work. And that's connected to a Kuhnian view of science. Now, I have a very strong Kuhnian view of both, both science and philosophy. And I can go into that, but it's not really part of big science. Uh, but it's to do with a book that he wrote called The Structure of Scientific Revolutions, which basically, I think, undertakes a disguised Marxist view of how science changes. And I'm going to cover that at some point, but it's not actually on the GCSE syllabus. So basically, what you need to remember is that there is evidence in favour of continental drift in the stripes of magnetism in mineral deposits, because coal is found in corresponding places if you fit the jigsaw together and also in fossils in the form of Glossopteris, Synognathus and Lystrosaurus among a lot of other things. And there are various other bits of evidence and they all basically fit quite well together. So if you like this video please rate, comment, share and subscribe. If you dislike it please tell me and thanks for people who have told me so that I can make it better and um, I'll see you tomorrow.